Now, today I want to dive into the message. I want to talk about praying matters more than you know. You can pull out your message notes. We have these each and every week. My outline is in it. I want to encourage you, if you don't get a worship guide, grab the message notes so that you can take them with you um, and then study them throughout the week. It's important to, to not only hear it here, but to take it with you and to study. Now, spending time with God matters, and we know that. Uh, I think what we have to understand is it matters more than you know. Have you ever had something matter more than you knew at the time? Anybody ever had something matter? I mean, you know it was important, but you didn't realize how important it was until it was too late. So a couple of weeks ago, I was at the store with my boys at the hardware store and picking out some things for the house. And, you know, it's, it's, it's on our Christmas break. And so how many men had some honeydews? Had a couple of days off, and so I'm fixing some things at the house, and my boys were all shopping. And my wife sends me this picture. <laughs> you know where I'm going. Of a hook. I mean, just four hooks. And she said, hey, baby, if you're out, if you could get this, that would be great. Um, you know, and so I'm at the hardware store, so I go look, and I'm like, well, that's not the picture of what my wife sent me. It's not what she wants. She wouldn't want those. That's not really it. And so I didn't think anything of it, grabbed my stuff, I'm excited, I'm going back home to do the honeydew list, and I get home and uh, start to pack, unpack everything, and she says, hey, did you get those hooks? I said, no, I didn't get the hooks. She said, why not? I said, well, I looked, and what they had, you wouldn't have wanted. She said, well, did you go anywhere else? <laughs> I said, no. I thought it was a suggestion. She looked me in the eye, she's like, it wasn't a suggestion. And I said, but you know, I was tired. I just wanted to come home. And, and she just looked at me. How many husbands have ever had that look? And I realized at that moment that that hook mattered more than I knew. And then later that night when I got ready to snuggle, how many know she was tired? <laughs> it mattered a little bit more than I knew. How many students have ever had that happen? You know, you're at, you're, at, you're at school and your teacher says, hey, there's going to be a test tomorrow. And you're thinking, that's awesome. It's no big deal. I'm, I'm like the ace master and I got all this down and I know I've had it happen to me. And, and you walk in and you didn't study because you just thought it was another test. And then the teacher tells you before you take the test, oh, by the way, this is worth 25% of your semester grade. I mean, you knew the test was important, you just didn't realize it was that important. It mattered more than you knew. So look, here's the way prayer is. We realize prayer is important. The challenge is we don't realize how important it is for us. It matters more than you know, and it's really so important. God, throughout the whole of, of counsel of Scripture, talks about prayer. In 1 Thessalonians, look at what Paul says. He says, pray continually. I'm convicted on two words, pray continually. I didn't even have to read all the New Testament. I'm like, continually, all right, God, I, I'm doing pretty good a couple of times a day. I mean, continue. how many of you pray continually? Yeah, I didn't think anybody's going to lie up in the church except one person right back there. That's all right. But, but it wasn't a suggestion. Paul's telling you what to do. Look in Colossians 4.2. He says, devote yourself to prayer. Now, devotion is a pretty strong word. I mean, devote yourself. How many could honestly, and you don't have to raise your hand and make everybody feel bad, but could say, I've devoted my life to prayer? No, no. no. But it matters. I mean, he's telling us to devote your, yourself to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Praying matters. It makes a difference in our life. And we see the example of Jesus all throughout the Gospels. Look in Matthew 14, 23. It says, after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to and look at Mark, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place, and he? Pray. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places, and he? Pray. When Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray. pray and not give up. And then look in Luke again. It says, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to? Pray. And spent the night. Pray. How many of you have ever spent the night praying? I mean, Jesus is the example, right? I mean, for us, you could say, well, but he was all God. Yeah, but you got God living on the inside of you. You got the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. And so he's not going to example or be the example of anything that he doesn't expect us to do. 
And so what we have to ask ourselves is if prayer matters, what, you know, why is it that I'm not praying? And before we even answer that, we've got to say, what is prayer? So if I, what, what, what is it? Let, let me tell you what prayer is not. Prayer is not magic. It's not like some genie in a bottle that you rub and you say, all right, cool. This is what I want. I'm going to make this hocus pocus. No, no, it, it, it's not magic. Prayer is not where you make demands to God. You don't go up to God and say, I demand that you give me this. And, and no, no, how many know you don't demand anything from God? God commands us. We can, we can make a suggestion, we can ask, we can plead, but we're not going to demand. Prayer is not a guarantee against suffering. Can I tell you that? Come on, somebody. Prayer is not a guarantee against suffering. You're going to have struggles and trials in your life. Just because you pray doesn't mean you're never going to go through anything. It doesn't keep it from happening. You know what prayer does? It gives you strength when you walk through the trials and the valley of the shadow of death. Prayer is not an opportunity to show off. It's not an opportunity to show how spiritual you are, so how religious you are, how good you are. No, prayer is all about connecting with God. It's all about developing a relationship with Him. And really, when we look at it, some people say, well, but how do I develop a relationship with God? I mean, He's God and I'm me, and I, I don't understand. Well, really, it's a lot like you would develop a relationship with anybody else. If you want to develop a relationship, you got to spend time with the person. You don't spend time with them, you're never going to have a relationship. You got to have focus with a person. If you're not focused on them, you're not going to have a relationship. You got to spend energy on that person. Come on, somebody. That's how you have a relationship. You got to put forth some effort. Well, it's the same thing with God. He needs all of those things. He needs time. He needs focus. He needs energy. He needs our effort. And the key is this look, you don't want to just know about God. That's religion. There's a lot of people that know about God that are headed straight for hell. A lot of good people that do good things that know about God, but the Bible says he will come on that day and say, depart from me, you wicked, evil doers. I did not know you. I did not gnosko you. Well, what do you mean then? That means we've got to have a relationship. It's not about doing the right thing or saying the right thing or knowing about God. It's about gnosko. It's about knowing God, having a relationship with him. And our time with God is what fuels our life. It's, it's what gives us what we need as Christians. And it helps us to be filled up with all that we're going to have to face and be able to walk through the trials the way God wants us to. We fill up with his presence each day. That's what prayer should do for us. Prayer's like what a car needs, gasoline, we need prayer. Now, look, I get it. You know, gasoline in a car, some of you ladies... You don't really believe cars need gasoline to drive. I got it. I got it. I can't tell how many times I've gotten in Phyllis's car and her gas light's on because her gas tank is. The other night I got into the car, I got a meeting. For whatever reason, I took her car. I'm like, hey, I'm just going to take your car. I'm going to go. And no big deal. Like, I don't look at the gas gauge often because my truck stays full. Like, it's just a principle. I fill it up and... I get in the car and the light is on. How many know? And now you've got digital gauges. Anybody got a digital gauge? So not only is the gas light on, it tells you how many miles you have till you run out of gas. I had two miles. <laughs> two. Like my heart had a palpitation. Oh, she thinks it's okay. Two is just a suggestion. Like we can go far beyond two. I've actually been to negative 10, negative 12. Like it goes negative. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So why did it show that? Because the gas tank was on empty. And some of you have been living your life on empty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, your gas light's been on. So you come to church on Sundays and you fill up. But you don't realize you need to fill up on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And so your life runs on empty. And, and here's the challenge, right? You can be living a good life. You can come to church. You can do the right things. You can hang out with the right people. And yet your life feels like this. And you probably said it. I feel burned out. Well, how do you get burned out? Because you're not filled up. When we get filled up, you can't get burned out. God will never let you experience less than what his power has given you the strength to walk through. And so you got to fill up on the power of God in our lives. 
You can't live your life on empty. And so prayer is the fuel for our lives. Prayer is powerful. Look at what James 5.16 says. It says the prayer of a righteous person is and it's powerful. It's effective. Its effects in our life are limitless. There are no barriers, no limitations. Power comes into our life when we pray. And yet, why do you think we neglect it? I mean, if we know how important it is in our head, the truth is we don't believe it in our hearts. Because if you believed it in your heart, you would actually do it. So what keeps us from praying, I, I think it's a couple of things. I think people don't believe God hears you. So we don't believe God hears us. What do you mean, Pastor? He doesn't listen to me. He may listen to you, Pastor. He may listen to the, the dream team. He may listen to other people, but he don't listen to me. And here's another thing. If he listens, he don't care. How many have ever felt? Now, you pro- listen, you would never articulate that. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't say, well, God don't care. But in your heart, you feel like he doesn't care. Because you've been looking at everybody else's life. You're saying, but God, you did this for them and you did this for them. And the truth is, you don't know what it took for them to get what you're looking at. You don't know how many tears they've cried. You don't know how many prayers they prayed. You don't know what kind of hell they walked through. And yet we judge what we have by what others experience. And we say, God, you must not care. Now, again, you may not articulate it, but it's what you feel on the inside. We think that maybe we're not qualified to pray. I get it. You know, I, I, when I started pastoring, I didn't think I was qualified to pastor. I mean, I think it's a joke that I'm a pastor and ha, 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 ha. And what I mean by that is I remember at 19 years old saying, I will never, pa-, like, I will do anything in the world. I'll scrub up toys, but I don't ever want to pastor. I couldn't imagine being in the same city with the same people each and every weekend living life together. And, and I just, because to me, it was like I'd never felt qualified. And then look at what God does in the journey. He just, each step of the way changes your heart. Now the truth is this, I don't even like to travel because I love being here so much. I don't wanna be gone because this is my home and you're my people. And how God has shifted, but I, but I remember how unqualified I felt as a pastor even launching this church. I, I'm not a theologian. I work hard, I study, I feel like I'm a student of the word of God. I don't have a theological degree. I do have a degree of, in, in the school of hard knocks. I mean, I walk you all through that one. And, uh, but what I realized is God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And so what we have to do is say, God, I'm, I'm a believer. I'm a son or daughter. And so I am qualified to pray. And some of you have felt unqualified. And you don't feel like you've got what it takes. You need to know you've got what it takes. And then some people feel like it just doesn't make a difference. Like when I pray, God just doesn't really hear me. Uh, you prayed about a couple of big things and you didn't feel like God responded the way that you thought he should. And I, I want you to know all of those are valid, but we've got to just address them and realize none of those can be excuses anymore. Prayer matters. God wants us to pray and it matters more than you know. And that's why the devil will deceive us and keep us from doing the thing that will create the most power and momentum in our lives. So I want you to know three things. First thing is this, prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. See, the early church knew this. And so we find even in Acts chapter one, verse 14, that they all joined together consistently in prayer. They all joined together. It wasn't just like the select, it wasn't just the dream teamers, the leaders, the pastors. The Bible, the power of, of the New Testament, the power of Acts, where the church spreads to the ends of the earth, is the fact that they understood that their greatest responsibility was that they would pray consistently, not just individually, but that they would come together and pray. They understood that there was no prayer too great for God, there was no prayer too small for him, and prayer was going to be a priority in their life. And we just have to make it a priority in ours. I can't tell you how many times that I have prayed prayers that God has answered. And it's, it, sometimes you think, well, if I think it. No, it's not about just thinking it. We've got to articulate prayers. I, I, I remember last year, uh, I was praying for a friend of mine that I had met at the gym. And I don't know if he's in this service. It's Edgar. Um, he's at the gym, and we got to know each other. And I was praying for him in 21 days of prayer. I think it was last January. 
And I remember telling everybody here, I'm praying for God to save Edgar. I'm praying for God to touch his life. He's not going to church. And, and I really sense God wants to do something great. And we would call out the name Edgar. If you guys remember, we would pray over at the Dream Center. Well, it wasn't a couple of months later. Edgar and his new bride started coming to the church. He gave his life to Christ. They started serving God and come each and every week here at Anchor Bend. God answers prayer. Some of you have got loved ones that you stopped praying for because you felt like God's not going to save them. I want you to know the Bible says, as for me and my household, they shall be saved. God answers prayer. I remember the Pakistan crusade that we did and I felt like the Lord said we were going to Pakistan and, and, and to do the crusade was a step of faith. It cost $20,000 to do the crusade. We had 5,126 Muslims give their life to Jesus Christ. And I remember just the step of faith. I said, Lord, I really feel like you're saying to do this. I feel like you're calling us to go out and to make this impact. And, and, and I just began to pray and say, God, if it's your will, the money's gonna come in. And I remember standing up here saying, hey, we've got about half of it, we need about 10,000. That day in that service, at the end of it, someone walked up and handed me a $10,000 check and said, go preach the gospel. Amen. God answers prayer. I can't tell you how many times building the Dream Center, uh, going there and doing construction, if, if, you, if you don't realize this, that Dream Center didn't look like that even a year ago. I have pictures a year ago with still a, a red carpet, torn up stuff all throughout. That place looked like it was built when it was built, which was 1960. And it took hundreds of thousands of dollars to renovate it. We never did a building campaign. Never asked you to pledge. Now, I'm not saying there's not going to be a day where that doesn't happen. I believe God's going to give us this land this year. And I may ask you to do those things. But I began to just pray and say, God, we're going to build a campus that is excellent, that will be the hub of our outreach, not only to Rosenberg, but to the Fort Bend County. And God, I'm asking you to bring in the money supernaturally. And we began to do project after project after project. And if you've been to that campus, it is done first class because of the prayers we have prayed for God to do what only God can do. Yes. And I'll never forget you know, we're getting ready to do the AVL, and the AVL, to me, I feel like is pretty important. That's all this stuff here, which, by the way, our new screens and projectors and all that will be in in two weeks. We were able to order it from the Legacy. Awesome. I feel like it creates excellence, and excellence creates comfort. And I remember looking at the wall at the Dream Center, and I just said, you know, those are 10-foot walls. I don't know how you even put a projector in there to project uh, scriptures, and the screens are too small to get all the way to the back. It seats about 254 people. And I said, God, I really feel like, I, I just feel like we need an LED wall. And someone said, LED wall? Yeah. How I many know God loves excellence? Did I have the money? I didn't have the money. And I remember, I, I, but you know what I started doing? I started to make some phone calls. I said, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make some phone calls. Began to call, called a company in California. Uh, it said, hey, do you have something? They said, well, you know, you're in luck. We actually have. I told them the size. They said, we have some overstock left over from Easter. We just got to get rid of them. Here's the price. I said, well, that's a great price. It's too much for me. He said, what do you mean it's too much? He said, man, we've discounted like 20%. I said, man, I'm so grateful. It's so awesome. I said, but really, this is the amount that I was thinking about. I didn't even have the money. This amount that I'm thinking about. And he kind of <laughs> laughed. And I kind of laughed. And then he didn't say anything, and I didn't say anything. <laughs> he didn't say anything, I didn't say anything. We just sat there on the phone, and he said, wow. I said, wow. <laughs> he said, let me talk to my manager. I said, it's great, man. He said, it's no big deal. I, I mean, no, when you ain't got the money, it don't matter anyway. <laughs> I'm just saying. I said, okay, just call him, let me know. He called me back. He said, we'll do it. Not only will we do it, we'll ship it for free. We'll install it for free. He said, we've never sold it for this cheap amount. So here, yeah, I still didn't have the money. <laughs> I said, that's awesome. I said, now let me talk to the trustees. And I just prayed. I said, God, I feel like this is really from you. I said, you know, I really want to raise the standard at Rosenberg. And the truth is, we can't project. We need the whole thing. How many have ever seen that wall? Isn't it beautiful? It's like, woo, we're watching the Super Bowl in that thing. I promise you this. <laughs> the next day. Somebody said, Pastor, I'd like to take you out to lunch. He doesn't even go to our church. I said, sure, let's go eat lunch. I'm always open to having lunch. 
We sat across from each other. He just began to talk about what his business was doing, asked me what we were doing. He had sowed into us before. He said, I just want you to know I, I've got another X amount of dollars that I'm going to invest. I'll have you a check. It'll be there tomorrow. And that was what we needed to buy the screen. I mean, no, I, I call that, I'm like, praise God. Let's get that screen here before you change your mind. Come on, somebody. God answers prayer. He cares about little things. He cares about big things. And you just, what you have to do is say, I'm not going to quit. Why? Because God cares and prayer changes things. Prayer matters more than you know. But not only does prayer change things, prayer changes me. You know, there have been many times that I have prayed in my life for God to change circumstances. But the truth is, the circumstance doesn't change, I change. And, and here's why, you know, I don't know about you, but I like the easy way. I, you can think I'm great all day long, but I'm just like everybody else. I want the easy way, no suffering, nothing. Like, like let's, how, anybody with me? You're like, come on. Straight line's the easiest way. God never takes you in a straight line. Hate to tell you, it's always zigzag. And you're like, well, I thought we were going, okay, yeah, yeah. And so I begin to pray for, for, for things to change. How many have ever prayed for someone to change? God, I need you to change my spouse. You better do something with them or I'm going to kill them. You said till death do us part and somebody is about to die. <laughs> I mean, I know nobody's ever experienced that. It's real funny, huh? The funnier thing is God doesn't change them. God changes you. And what I've always seen is every time I've tried to get Phyllis to change, God just points some things out in me. And when I change, guess what happens to Phyllis? She changes. How many have ever tried to change your kids? God, you better fix them. I brought them in and I'll take them out. Praise God. <laughs> you know, amen. Some of you done took them out. That's all right. I ain't going to say nothing. I know we in the bird. Yeah, but what happens? God says, you need to be more loving. God says, you need to be more kind. God says, you need to change. So, so we try to change things by prayer, and God ends up changing us. Kids, teenagers, how many have ever tried to ask God to change your parents? If they just understand, oh, Lord, just help them. And, and, and you try to pray, God's, God's, just give them wisdom, Lord, because I'm the smartest thing in our house. They are clearly idiots. <laughs> I know I've been a teenager. You're like, my parents don't know nothing nothing. And what happens, teenager? You, you pray and God changes you. He says, why don't you be a little more respectful? Why don't you be a little more kind? Why don't you be a little more patient and understand that you're not the only thing they have to deal with? Why? Because prayer not only changes things, prayer changes us. And then the third thing is this, prayer gives me strength. It really does give us strength. It helps me to have strength in the gap. While I'm praying for God to change things, while I'm praying and, and having God change me, it's the thing that fills in what I need in the gap. In the meantime, God, I, I just need strength to walk through the valley that I'm walking through. I need, I need strength to persevere when I'm tired. I need strength to keep going when I'm weak. God, I need more of you. So what does prayer do? It fills up your tank. God, just fill me up. More of you. I love what Daniel eleven thirty two 32 says. It says, those that know their God. That word there, know, is gnosko. That have an intimate relationship with God. Dan Daniel understood that if I'm going to make it in this, this, this environment, in this culture that hates God and doesn't want anything to do with God, I've got to know God. I've got to have a relationship with God. And look at what it says. They will be strong and do great exploits for him. Strong and do great exploits for him. God's got things for you to do. God's got people for you to impact. God's got places for you to go. God's, God's got a life for you to live, but you can't do it apart from him. And so many of us, we know prayer is important, but we haven't been praying. Like we know it here, but we don't know it here. And we wonder why we are so burned out. We're so tired, we're so frustrated, we're so weak. It's because we've not experienced all of God. Now, I don't know if you've ever been snorkeling or scuba diving. 
For my honeymoon, Phyllis and I went to Acapulco, and uh, we went snorkeling for the very, very first time. And it, it, it was a great experience. I'll never forget, we got on the boat, and a whole bunch of people on the boat, and they drove us to the ocean, and they had a coral reef out in the ocean, and we had our swimsuits on, and they gave us these masks and these snorkels, and they said, here it is, it's right here. You just jump into the ocean, and you swim just flat, and you just kind of stay on the surface, and you can look at all the beauty that's in the sea. And it's amazing if you've ever been snorkeling. How many of you have ever been snorkeling? I, I want to encourage you. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing to experience, especially in clear water and when there's a coral reef, and you could see all the stingrays, and you could see all the tropical fish, and you could see the coral, everything down at the bottom. And, and this is the whole thing I love about it. It doesn't even take a lot of effort. Like, I'm just like, I'm fat anyway, so I float. I just float. You come on, somebody. We just float like a bobber. I'm just, it's good. It ain't no big deal at all. You know, you just kind of fat and fluffy floats to the top and get to see it. And then when I was done, I just jumped back on the boat, went on, and it was great, man. It was a memory for a lifetime. It was awesome. A couple years later, went into Mexico on another vacation, and I thought, hey, I don't want to just go snorkeling. Why don't we go scuba diving? I don't know if you've ever been scuba diving. Scuba diving is a little bit different. You don't stay on the surface. You actually go into the depth of the sea. And it's a different experience. Not only do I get to see the beauty, I get to experience the beauty. So not only do I get to see stingrays, you could actually touch them. You can go to the bottom and touch the sand. You're not supposed to touch the coral reef. And I'm not saying I did or didn't. I'm just saying you can. You swim in the depth, you get lost in the experience of what's taking place. Why? Because you're experiencing the ocean. You're experiencing the beauty. You're not just on the surface watching it. And, and this is what I would say so many Christians live on the surface of what God has for them. In your relationship with God, you're in the ocean. Look, you're saved. It's awesome. But you just know God because you've seen God. You know what he can do because you see what he's doing in everybody else's life. Now, he saved you, so you're, you're better off than most. But the truth is, you've never taken the effort, the time, and the energy to go deep with God. And this is my challenge over the next 21 days is, will you go deep with God? Will you take it from just the knowledge of God to an experience with God? Will you allow God to consume your life? Will you, that, that's what these next 21 days are all about. We're doing 21 days of prayer and fasting. And really what it's all about is, look, I'm going to take these next 21 days and I'm going to stop living on the surface. Look, I know prayer matters, but I got to go from knowing to knowing because it matters more than I know. And I know this, that if I'll draw near to God, God will draw near to me. That's what James 4, 8 says. And so in the 21 days of prayer, see, some of the challenge in your life is this. You've been waiting for God to draw near to you. Oh, God, when you, no, 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 it's, it's your turn. Tag, you're it. You are now required to pursue God. You're now required to say, look, I'm going to go deep. What's that mean? That means, look, the next 21 days, we're going to get up early. We're going to pray often. We're going to listen to worship. We're going to get rid of the things of the world. That, that's what fasting is all about. 21 days of prayer and fasting. There's a couple of ways you can fast. You can do a whole fast, no food for 21 days. If you do that, just consult your doctor. It's great. Cleanses your body, focuses you. It's amazing. You do a partial fast where you just say, I'm going to skip a meal. And in that meal, I'm going to pray and spend time with God. You can do a Daniel's fast, which is basically no meats and sweets, just vegetables and fruits and nuts and for 21 days, what you're doing is you're altering your lifestyle and saying, God, I love these things, but I love you even more. And then not only in the physical, I want to encourage you to take a media fast. Some of you need to get off social media. You've been spending more time on Instagram than with God. You, you care more about what others think than what God says. And so maybe it's, it's jumping off a of television or whatever it is, but what you're saying is, God, I'm going to calm my life down. I'm going to focus on you. Why? Because it matters more than I know. Yeah. And then if you can meet us at the Dream Center, Monday through Friday from 6 to 7 a.m., we're going to pray together. Some of you, you don't feel qualified to pray. Praying is simple. 
It's a conversation with God. And if you'll come to the Dream Center, we'll actually train you for the next 21 days. It, it's, it's, it's an hour long. It doesn't feel like an hour. We go in there and we sing a couple worship songs, give a nugget, share truth, spend a few minutes by ourselves. Then we come back, sing another worship song, and then we pray corporately. It's amazing how fast that hour goes and what God does in our life in that hour. And it's just 21 days. Some of you say, well, you know, I don't know if I can make it work. I'm asking you to readjust your life. Some of you say, well, my boss wants me in at 8 o'clock and I can't make it through the traffic. Why don't you say, hey, listen, give me one week to go pray. And if I'm not a better employee after these next five days, then I'll go back to the regular schedule next week. I promise you, your boss will say, go pray all year long. <laughs> oh, no, no, go pray. Did you pray this morning? Because you're much better when you pray. <laughs> that, that's what I'm asking us to do is like rearrange your life. Like my kids will be there at 6 a.m. and leave at 6.45 to go to school. We rearrange our family. We re Why? Because we're going deeper with God. <clears throat> and whatever depth you go into in the next couple of weeks, this is what I found, that sets the depth for the rest of the year. <clears throat> so where will we go with God this year? And I'm asking you and just challenging you to say, God, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make this the year where I go deep with you, deeper than I've ever been. I'm gonna learn more than I've ever learned. I'm gonna experience more than I've ever experienced. And this is gonna be our greatest year yet. Father, I thank you for what you're doing. Father, I pray that you move in our hearts and move in our lives. That God, even over the next 21 days, I'm asking you that starting tomorrow that that grace kicks in. Today we're gonna to go prepare and set out clothes and rearrange schedules and and, and even for those that can't make it to the Dream Center, we're going to get up early. We're going to pray at our house. We're going to spend time, not just when we're driving, but God, we're going to focus on you with some extra time. And God, what I'm asking is, would you speak to your people? God, what I'm asking is, would you reveal yourself to them? Lord, there's nothing greater than when you reveal yourself to us. Nobody has to tell us. Nobody has to force us. Nobody has to drive us. It's amazing that one encounter with you can shift us the rest of our lives. Let it be, God. Let this be the season and the year that we go deep with you in an authentic relationship like never before. Keep your head bowed and your eyes closed. There's some of you here this morning talking about praying and fasting and prayer. And maybe you've prayed some prayers before, but the truth is you don't have a relationship with God. You've never surrendered your life to Him. And you're in this place right now and you're ready to start that relationship. You say, right now, I'm ready to give Him my life. I'm ready to turn my life over to Him and surrender everything to Him. This is your moment. With heads bowed and eyes closed. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lead us in a prayer. I'm not gonna ask you to stand up or walk down but what I will do is before we pray I want to see who I'm praying with and even as an act of surrender just raise your hand and just say this is me God right here right now I'm surrendering my life to you this is my moment I've given it all to you I want to know you and have a relationship with that you just raise your hand yes 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 come on church tell them how proud you are Let's pray this. I'm going to lead you in this prayer of surrender. Say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I give you everything. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Forgive me of my past. Cleanse me of my sin. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your power. Let me never be the same from this moment on. In Jesus' name. And everyone says. Come on, worship God this morning.